like everyone wants to know like what kubernetes is of course like it's it's a very hot hot technology but what actually kubernetes is so we have kubernetes we have containers and uh, now you have this startup called break.dev what yeah. does that add to the game kubernetes is very powerful but what we want to do in rig dev is to lift this complexity away from the engineers in our mind it shouldn't really be something that every engineer has to learn Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the season three of This Is Tech Talk. So I'm really excited uh, because we are reviving this podcast again. And uh, this season, uh, we have our first guest, uh, who is Benjamin uh, from Rig.dev. So uh, welcome, Benjamin, uh, to the show. And uh, we you. have our co-host, Lars, with us today. And uh, hey, Lars, how, how are you doing? Hello, I'm freezing. It's cold. It's winter. <laughs> I think everyone is. I mean, yeah, it's even in Germany, it's like minus minus two, minus three. And it's been like snow for like last few, uh, almost a week now. So, uh, yeah, let's let's go to our uh, guest, Benjamin. So, Benjamin, would you like to introduce yourself and how are you feeling? Like, it's, it's yes. a freezing temperature right now. Like, I've, uh, uh, I found like the wool and socks in the bottom of my drawer. So, it's, yeah, it's cold. <laughs> um well, uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm uh, Benjamin, and uh, I work in a small startup called Rick.dev, where we uh, try to make it easier to adopt Kubernetes in organizations. First question, of course, uh, like everyone wants to know like what Kubernetes is. Of course, like it's it's a very hot hot technology, but what actually Kubernetes is? So. Like in a very simply put, it's basically just a container scheduler. So it puts uh, workloads on different servers and then like handles uh, all of the requirements that you might have about how many containers do you want running across set amount of services. And then it does uh, like uh, networking. So it distributes traffic across actual uh, service where containers might be running so it's sort of a sort of a system to deploy your applications and run them in a highly available fashion you talked about something called containers what is containers yeah so uh, containers are basically just a tool for packaging your applications so uh back in the back in the old day you'd have like your server where your applications were running then you'd need if it was a Java application, for instance, you'd need a specific version of uh, the Java runtime installed on the server. Uh, you might need some other tools installed on the server, which your Java code also depended on. So all of this uh, stuff that lives around your application, the environment that the ap application lives in, that's basically the container. So you take the environment and the application and box it in a shippable format and that's your container and that's like there's a standard for that so once you have done that you can deploy it on a system that supports containers basically interesting so unless you have any questions here yeah we used to do that with virtual um, machines as well so what's the difference between a container and a virtual machine so uh I guess the difference is in the lightweight of it. So um, a container like piggybacks on the kernel of the Linux server that, is, that it runs on. So you don't need to like put everything in it and it's uh, way quicker to spin up a container on a, a Linux server that always is running. That's like order of magnitudes faster than spinning up a virtual machine. Okay. I, I remember that, like, back in old days when I used to do .NET. So we used to actually build everything, then, like, take that. Yeah. And actually, we had a, a real server where you used to log in, put those, uh, like, put distributables there, and then deploy it. I think yeah. that's... Uh, so container is way to automate that. So you don't need to do that anymore, right? Exactly. Ah, cool. And uh, okay, so whenever we talk about containers, uh, I hear a one word a lot like, okay, uh, it works on my machine, right? So this is the problem it is trying to solve. Yes, exactly. So, like you, uh, sh you ship your, the application with like a 
an environment that doesn't change wherever you deploy it. Wherever you deploy it, you have like sort of a guarantee that it works the same. It's um, a little off topic, but still related. Uh, there's a work in progress standard called development containers. Have you heard about that? Like uh, Nope. I don't okay. know that project. Okay, so I f- yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's JSON based, so it, it describes a container image and some extensions that are supported by VS Code or whatever. And then you can add some. So you have a base image, and you can add some so-called features, and that all stacks up to uh, a development. So, so for local development image, uh, so that okay, so, developers so. share an environment. And you can even uh, use the CLI or your CI CD provider to use the same development container image for local development and in CI. Uh, so yeah, it, it's another an extension of that. It yeah, works yeah. on my machine trying to bundle that up for development purposes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's basically like a, a development environment that you can like put on different systems and expect it to behave the same. Like yeah, and there's all of the development startup, tools, startup uh, commands, and and things like that. Next, uh, yeah, so yeah. it builds on top of of OCI containers. Yeah, that sounds cool. Like I have been like in several places where uh, there was always these issues where uh, the supporting tool that was like used for some part of the application uh, that differed in what version was installed across the development machines. And then that resulted in all sorts of weird things. Like, for instance, if it was a code generator, the code would be generated differently depending on what version you're running. And so there is there is for sure advantages in being able to uh, align on stuff like that through tooling. Yeah, so if you ever go into, say, a GitHub repo, and you see a .dev container, .json file, or .dev container folder with some files in it. That's the development container. And if if your editor supports that, maybe you need to install an extension, and then you can spin up uh, your editor inside of the container described by that uh, dev container configuration, and it'll set up everything for you, and you will have the exact same environment, maybe with your preferred extensions as well. Uh, as everyone else, and even the mm. same one running in CI, so you should be able to reproduce everything. Uh, it's it's useful for me. I'm on Windows. If I want to contribute to say NX, they have a development container uh, because all of their CI scripts runs on Linux. So when I try to run them on my local machine, they don't work. So I can't contribute anything. But then someone added the development container, and now I'm good. I I know that I I have to open GNX repo in my development container and then all the commands work again. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I yeah. I also like worked on a project at one point where it had to work in uh, VSL on Windows and it had to work on uh, Macs as well. And like that is terrible making that like there is so many things that's especially if you if you like you use all of the uh, uh, Linux tools and scripts, like you cannot ex- expect that they work the same inside of uh, the Windows environment. So for sure, That's for right. sure, there's for sure advantages in like bundling stuff like that up. Yeah, I hope we see see more of that in the future and in, in general in the open source environment because it really helps people yeah. uh, ease the path of contributing to your project when. Mm-hmm. And get a working environment easily. But uh, so we have Kubernetes, we have containers, and uh, now you have this startup called rig.dev. What yeah. does that add to the game? Okay, so I want to step uh, a few steps back again. So Kubernetes is this container orchestration platform that uh, has basically won market majority with regards to doing this so almost like i'll say most companies actually use kubernetes but if they have like some sort of a a deployment system chances are it's kubernetes underneath or 
more or less managed. Like it has gained so much traction. And Kubernetes is very powerful. Like uh, the APIs of Kubernetes enables you to do a lot of good stuff. Like uh, it's basically like a very flexible platform where you can like um, you basically get free reins to uh, make your deployment platform whatever you want it to be. And uh, with all of that flexibility comes a lot of complexity. And uh, when you're in, a, in an organization and uh, your organization tells you, okay, if you want to deploy, you need to use the Kubernetes APIs. You just need to make a Helm chart. You need to put in some uh, values and then you need to add a deployment and you need to uh, ensure Oh, by the way, you need to ensure that the security context is set up correctly so that we are sure that our workloads are running uh, securely. Um, you need to set up RBAC so that you're sure that no one can accidentally access your resources. Uh, you need to set up network policies that ensures that uh, only the intended traffic reaches your workload. Like There is a lot of complexity in this. And... What we want to do in Rick Dev is to lift this complexity away from uh, the engineers who are like just given these APIs and expected to uh, learn them, because um, the APIs are very powerful, very good APIs. But in our mind, it shouldn't really be something that every engineer has to learn. Um, and that's really the the idea about like behind our product and then we we really want to take that to uh one step further and like really create a good and developer friendly experience on top of kubernetes um and at the same time we want to like um coexist in the ecosystem so uh, in an org in an organization that has like really hardcore kubernetes experts we want our product to be able to coexist so that uh, um, workloads can live alongside our product so it's not like we take over the Kubernetes environment and everything has to go through our system uh, it makes a lot of sense to run stuff uh, which isn't uh, through the, through RIC so uh, that could be like infrastructure components and stuff like that but we want to like target the developers in the organizations who uh, shouldn't necessarily need to learn these complex APIs. They should be able to focus on uh, creating value for the organization and like doing what they're hired for instead of struggling to figure out how to deploy their stuff. So that's that's really what Rick is. That's sort of a an overview at least. We started out as a, a, a solely uh, where everything was open source. Uh, but we struggled a little bit to to like find a good business case in that. So we did a sort of a little bit of a pivot where we transitioned to like more of an, an open core uh, model where we have like uh, all of our uh, Kubernetes uh, abstractions is open source. It can, in ca it can easily be run standalone. And then we take that and build sort of a developer experience that's more uh dashboard and uh a lot of extra tooling that sort of simplifies even further on top of the abstractions that are that are in the, like our open core part of our project uh so that's that's where we're at now uh if that's where we'll be in a year it's hard to tell so what what can you self host with break which parts so, are free? You can self-host it, use it that so, way, and which so, parts are paid? Actually, we, actually, we want... We want uh, uh, I have a bit of an echo now. It's gone. I think it was less. Yeah. Oh. Um, actually, we want our whole product to be self-hosted. Um, we won't be providing a hosted uh, version. Uh, so that means that our uh, open core is self-hostable. And our our paid version will also be um, 
on premise. So we want our product to like exist in uh, organizations uh, existing Kubernetes infrastructure, basically. Yeah. So that 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 means that that's if if we go back to the the whole thing about us pivoting a little bit to the open core model. Uh, that's also because we don't really see our product making a lot of sense in a hosted version. And when we don't do that, going like full open source is then it's then it just becomes hard to like find a business model. So we'll so we will we we will basically try to sell uh, a high level development experience uh, on top of the open core that we have. That's sort of where we're at for now, at least. I mean, uh, just to like understand, like why this business model? Because if you see most startups, they are moving towards like their own cloud-based solutions, right? Where they have mm -hmm. something where you can just log in and deploy your things. So, mm -hmm. uh, what's this? Why this call, right? Uh, just to understand. Yeah. So, a lot of companies have bought into uh, the whole hype or. Hype is maybe a, a little bit of a negative word, but it's 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 a it's a word that describes what's been happening. Like a lot of companies that started using Kubernetes, thinking that it would solve all of their problems with deploying their software, and then uh, day two comes and it dawns on them that our engineers are actually struggling using these APIs that we give to them. So we have a lot of companies that have bought into this technology. They have infrastructure that's already been set up. Um, some of the organization is using it actively. Uh, others are struggling to like really get the benefits from it. Um, so there is a lot of, of like existing Kubernetes environments out there, and we want our product to like fit into that, and uh, at the same time uh, solve the struggles that these organizations have with with uh, in internally adopting Kubernetes across the organization. I, I haven't bothered to learn Kubernetes things yet. I mean, I used it a lot. I've worked on teams who were using Kubernetes. Uh, I've worked in organizations where someone was building something like rig so that people didn't mm -hmm. have to learn too much about Kubernetes, but still yes. use Kubernetes. And now I'm looking into your documentation. I'm seeing that you have a, this concept called a capsule. Yes. Uh, so there's yeah so how does that fit into the picture so uh we we have the like the the capsule abstraction is sort of our high level higher level abstraction that's that's part of our open core or like the the core thing of rig so it's basically an api that uh lets you add a capsule to a cluster and then uh depending on what stuff you set up uh, you would then get like a lot of uh, derived resources from that. Like it would set up a service for networking. It would set up an ingress if you wanted to expose some uh, some traffic to the internet, for instance. It would set up uh, certificates. It would set up uh, horizontal pod auto scaling, so you could get auto scaling, and like all of these different APIs that you, as a developer, would need to know how to use. We sort of try to like shove all of that into one abstraction and then like greatly simplify it. And we really just want to hit maybe 95% of all use cases because 95% of all use cases look very, very similar when you deploy to Kubernetes. So that's that's sort of our, our target. So instead of a developer needing to learn a lot of different APIs, they just need to know this one API and that's it. So uh, I think in uh, in our conversation, I got one more word, uh, which is called Helm chart. What is Helm chart? Yeah. So uh, Helm chart is is so Helm in itself is basically a release manager for Kubernetes. It's that combined with templating. Instead of writing all of these different YAML files that you would need to write uh, for each of your different environments that are configured a little bit differently, you can use uh, Helm templating to like change the configuration of some components so that it acts different differently when it's hosted in Europe compared to when it's hosted in the US, for instance. So instead of you having to 
have multiple uh, different YAML files for each environment, like huge YAML files. Helm has templating, so you just you might like just pass in two or three differing values, and then that would like generate the YAML that is actually applied to Kubernetes. So it's sort of a layer in between uh, deployment and the actual YAML that hits the Kubernetes APIs. So it's a, can I can I say something similar to what environment files are? So where yes, you have different, sort of. Uh, yeah. Okay. Interesting. So uh, do we need to like with Rig? Do I need to still go ahead and learn about Helm, how it works, or how to write it? No. Rather, or so, oh, okay. uh, in in Rig, you need to know what a container is. You need to know how to be able to, uh, or you need to know how to build a container. Um, and that is probably the only API that you need to know, know or the only like extra technology that, that you need to know. Like then we have a graphical user interface in the, that, but like the graphical user interface is, is a part of the paid product. Um, so either you'd need to know the one, uh, capsule API, uh, it's exposed as a, as, as a standard Kubernetes API that you can use towards Kubernetes. You'd either need to know that, or you could make it even easier for yourself and use our paid product that's, that has the graphical user interface that makes it like very straightforward. And uh, what are the tools like to create containers? Probably you'll be using Docker here, or? Yes. Yeah, I was interested since I read in your documentation about GitOps, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Flux and Argo CD. Argo CD. What's the status on supporting those with Rig? Yeah, I can yeah. talk a little bit about that. So um, we really want Rig to fit into the existing uh, Kubernetes ecosystem. During the past, maybe I don't know, three to four years, there's been this evolving pattern about uh, GitOps, which is sort of a, a way where you use uh, Git as the source of truth for what resources you have inside of Kubernetes. So you have uh, this small uh, service that you install inside of Kubernetes, which then pulls uh, configuration YAML files from a Git repository and applies them internally. So instead of, for instance, having a CI pipeline that like uh, builds your Docker image and then uh, applies the, the YAML file to your Kubernetes cluster, you would build your Docker image, and then you would change the version in the GitOps repository that holds the configuration for how the state inside of the cluster should be. Uh, so that's that's sort of a, a pattern that's been gaining a lot of popularity because it has a lot of adva advantages with regards to uh, audit trails, uh, being able to roll back changes, and there's a lot of very cool things and advantages that you get from using GitOps. So we that's like one of the patterns that we want to support in Rick. We support that in through the Capsule API. Like you can, uh, the Capsule API is an API like any other Kubernetes API. So you could install the the Rick core, use uh, GitOps, add a YAML file containing a Capsule, and then uh, that would basically be like a simple sort of a GitOps support with Rick. Um, in our paid product, we have, uh, or we take it one step further. So usually when using GitOps, you'd make any changes through Git. So instead of using a UI where you'd click a few buttons, you'd go into the Git repository, change a YAML file, change some other YAML file, create a pull request, get that merged. What we try to do with Rick is that you would still be able to use a graphical user interface but when you click the deploy button, for instance, it wouldn't like directly push the change to Kubernetes. Instead, it would commit uh, the YAML files to the GitOps repository. And then we would rely on the GitOps mechanism to actually apply the changes to the Kubernetes cluster. And we have, a, we have like an initial implementation of that, which works pretty well, but it's sort of still in the early stage. So that's using uh, Flux? And then you're also considering how to use Argo CD. Is that still yeah, correct? So, yes. so we are not really opinionated on whether people are using Flux or Argo CD because the pattern works the same. So yeah. 
um, that's not really something that we we really care about. But we have a work in progress, which is to sort of give a few examples on how uh, this actually looks in an actual Argo CD implementation and an actual Flux CD uh, implementation. Yeah, so you have a demo repo yeah. with Flux and Rig uh, yes. in a setup. OK, so you are a senior software engineer with Rig. So I imagine you have been in lots of Kubernetes teams and organizations. So what yes. are the major benefits that you see in Rig that you have missed in, in other setups? So you, I heard you mention this earlier, Lars, where you said that you had also been in companies where they were trying to make something similar to what Rick is. Uh, and I believe most companies will at some point, uh, it will dawn on most companies at some point that the Kubernetes APIs are too complex for all of their 100 engineers to like really take to heart. And that will cause them to do exactly that. And that will happen in any organization in parallel, they will try to do their best, make uh, uh, some sort of a, a higher level uh, platform in between Kubernetes and their developers. And uh, that's really our market fit, like that everyone is doing this in parallel. Uh, we want to like really try and do it very well. So I have one question, uh, question related to the recent drama. Like, of course, this podcast will be incomplete if you don't talk about Terraform. <laughs> and I just want to understand from your point of view, like, uh, was that a good call and how it impacted the community and what they might have done better? Well, they shouldn't have changed the license. <laughs> okay. But uh, how did it impact it? Uh, did it impact it like, in any ways or like? Well, you... yeah. So when working with uh, Kubernetes, you usually your a lot of companies are working are also using Terraform, uh, and they use Terraform to spin up the Kubernetes environment and maybe provision like a few uh, bare bones services inside of the the cluster so that it's ready to actually being used. Uh, so it sort of impacts a little bit into our domain as well. Truly believe that it won't really be a problem, also because the community will maintain a good fork and if HashiCorp doesn't like do anything about it, it will probably die at some point. Like their own version of Terraform was what I, I was referring to. So you believe in open TF? Yes. Like Terraform has become like such an integral part in, in IT infrastructure across organizations all around the world that it really like should be an open standard and it shouldn't be something that's very tied to one company and, then, and that's one of the cool things about kubernetes that it's been like very much let go of from the creators the original creators yeah and which, i believe i, I believe it would be healthy right? yes i would yeah, believe I, I, I really believe it would be healthy for for terraform to like get in the same state at some point yeah, I saw a very interesting documentary about the history of Kubernetes and how trying to make it open also in collaboration between the competitors, mm -hmm. that was a really risky move or innovative <laughs> move for, for in that era at yeah. Google. But they saw that they, they had to do this if they wanted this tool to grow outside of just Google. Yeah, and, and, and that whole thing is also just such a great advantage because it also makes uh, companies more flexible to like change underlying providers. Like it's, it's not like very easy. Like there's still things that can, can go wrong, but like uh, migrating from something that's solely running on Google Cloud with no Kubernetes to AWS with no Kubernetes, that's way harder than if you have the Kubernetes layer in both ends. So, yeah, there is some very cool things in that regard in Kubernetes. Nice. I have one last question. In your documentation, you describe in the CI/CD section, you describe you have some GitHub actions for mm -hmm. building an 
deploying rig uh, capsules. Yeah. Uh, what do you do if you're on GitLab? Uh, then you make it yourself or uh, create an issue for us to make it. <laughs> but the, it will it will for sure like um, we have like we are like in 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 the initial uh, meetings with potential customers and we are sort of like getting feedback on like how do they do CI how do they do CI and I would guess that a lot of the decisions for what support we build is to like accommodate the first initial customers that we get their needs so something like that with regards to roadmap <laughs> since a big part of your code base is open source uh, what how can people contribute to rig yeah so uh the closed source stuff of rig uh, you can even contribute to that just create an issue on the open source repository like the closed source version of rig can like be easily run locally it can easily be hosted and run with uh, some limitations it's i think it's users it's a limitation i'm actually not entirely sure where the limitation is set but there is some limitations on running like a, f a free version of it do bug reports if something's not working do bug reports that's like the main way to contribute at least on the on the closed source stuff uh, the open source stuff is uh, mainly consists of kubernetes operator which introduces the capsule apis into kubernetes that can be run standalone if you experience anything on that level create back bug reports uh feel free to create a pr if you have any experience with kubernetes operators before and and uh, you notice that we are doing something weird in some cases pointed out like our team is like not that experienced with uh kubernetes operators like i'm the only guy that has like done kubernetes operators before and the others are learning like it's a very very good team but uh, the domain knowledge is something that's still sort of being spread around the team i think we are uh, we are almost at the end of the uh, podcast so we actually ask our guests if they want to promote something apart from of course the rig.dev or if you have some personal thing which you want to promote no rig.dev go check it out we have a uh, so get up repository a nice website a very nice mm -hmm. documentations uh, documentation page uh, we are working hard on the documentation these days it will get better each day on that note I just tried to click edit this page and it leads me to the old document I know. Post. <laughs> okay, we talked about that today actually okay, great. Well, that will be fixed yeah great that, that's an easy way for people to get involved in yes. asking questions or suggesting edits to the documentation yeah. so it's probably just a are you still using Docker Soros, it seems? So it's probably just yes. a configuration issue. Yeah, we moved. We moved. So we had the doc. We had the docs in a separate repository. Now we moved it into the main repository because we had some issues when we wanted to release a new version. We had to like release a new version, update it in the other repository, and it was just a hassle. So now we moved it into uh, the same repository, so we can like ease more easily automate that it's the actual correct version shown in the docs and stuff like that. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you for having me. Uh, th thanks a lot, Benjamin, uh, for being on the show. And we'll be back next week, I mean, for another episode. And yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Thank you, Lars, for joining us. And uh, yeah, have a great day.